As you may already know, I have a fairly substantial fear of the dentist, or literally more to the point, needles. I am more than happy to concede that this is an entirely irrational fear. Perhaps I need a new perspective. Perhaps looking back to the past will afford me a new appreciation of just how lucky I am. Around 300,000 years ago, the species Homo rhodesiensis showed signs of extreme wear on their teeth. Their tough diet and near-chronic abscesses were just one step on the long road of dental evolution to modern human beings. But it would be a few hundred thousand years until dentists showed up. Around 7,000 BC, with the Indus Valley Civilization, we begin to see some of the first evidence for early dentists plying their trade. This comes in the form of holes drilled into teeth, presumably to remove decay. This drilling technology most likely came in the form of the bow drill, a fairly crude mechanical implement, but nonetheless effective. It is thought that bead making was the primary profession of these early dentists, who probably did house calls on the side. Though effective, this was likely far from a pleasant experience. Around 5000 BC, in southern Mesopotamia, Sumerians wrote down a key concept with regards to teeth. There is a text which describes the cause of dental pain and decay. They believed that such things occurred because of the toothworm. The toothworm was taken very seriously around 700 BC in the Assyrian city of Nineveh. A scribe, possibly suffering from toothache, took down an invocation against the toothworm. It deplores the worm's nature and begs the gods to strike it down. The concept of the toothworm was widely accepted up until the early 18th century. Practitioners would even yank at nerves thinking them worms until the idea was challenged by Pierre Fauchard. We will return to him. We now hop back to around 4500 BC and the Slovenian town of Loka. Researchers recently confirmed that a find made here in 1911 contained a beeswax filling. The filling was in a canine tooth of a man in his mid-twenties. The wax covered sensitive dentin exposed by a vertical crack in the tooth. As early as 3000 BC, the ancient Egyptians had dentists. The so-called Edwin Smith papyrus tells of the treatment of several oral ailments. And during the Second Dynasty, Hesira was named as the greatest of those who deal with teeth and of physicians. Egyptian skulls as early as 2900 BC have small holes drilled into jaws, probably to drain abscesses. Egyptian dentists would fix teeth in place with gold wire. They developed early recipes for toothpaste, which crushed burned ox's hooves, eggshells and myrrh, and even used opium as pain relief. However, they also believed that touching an aching tooth with a dead mouse might cure pain. Some evidence for ancient dentistry is indirect. Around 1800 BC, the Code of King Hammurabi states that bad physicians and dentists might be punished by having a hand removed. In Italy, in the 8th century BC, before Rome really started roaming, the Etruscans were flourishing. This fascinating Iron Age culture developed false teeth using human or animal teeth, held together with gold bands, and similar appliances held loose teeth in place. As early as the 5th century BC in ancient Greece, Hippocrates himself wrote about the treatment of decaying teeth and gum disease. Greek physicians also extracted teeth and used wire to stabilize teeth. In the early 1st century AD, Rome gained its first emperors. And it is around this time that the Roman physician Celsus was writing. He was the first to describe a lead filling in a cavity. But this was only to stabilize fragmented teeth for extraction. 
Around 15 AD, a Greek physician working in Rome, Archigenes, suggested drilling out tooth decay and stuffing it with roasted earthworms and the crushed eggs of spiders. The Romans gave dentistry its patron saint, Apollonia. In AD 249, she was martyred in Alexandria. All of her teeth were extracted forcibly. This reliquary from Portugal supposedly contains one of those teeth. What of the Saxons and Vikings of the latter first millennium AD in Northern Europe? Well, contrary to popular image, they tended to have really good teeth. This is due to a relative lack of sugar in their diets. Though a Viking's skull found in 2009 in Dorset had grooves filed into his two front teeth, probably to add to the ferocity of his appearance. Around the same time in China, during the Tang Dynasty, they developed probably the first toothbrushes using hog bristles. And in 1223, Japanese Zen master Dogen recorded that he saw monks in China cleaning their teeth with brushes made of horsetail hair. These were attached to an oxbone handle, and it would be centuries, 1690, before Anthony Wood would write of buying a toothbrush in Europe. In the intervening years, during the early Middle Ages in Europe, sciences such as medicine, surgery and dentistry were usually practiced by monks. However, a series of papal edicts in the 12th century expressly prohibited monks from performing any form of surgery. And so, dental care was no longer the purview of educated monks, but rather their less educated assistants, the people who shaved the monks' heads. Barber surgeons were let loose on the public, performing extractions, just at the time when sugar was becoming more and more popular in Europe. The great medieval surgeon Abu al-Qasim al-Zahrawi inspired European surgeons and by the 14th century people such as Guy de Chirliac invented the dental pelican. Resembling the beaks of a pelican, a similar tool is still used by dentists today for extractions. Dental care at this time depended very much on one's status in society. Barber surgeons continued to practice amongst the lower classes, though tried to stick to extractions and attempts at pain relief. By the 16th century, dental care had changed little. A Tudor dentist would be a painful experience. For the Tudor dentist, boiled frogs were a staple, and foul concoctions would be applied to rotten teeth to encourage them to fall out. There was some attempt to clean teeth, Frayed twigs would be rubbed on teeth with a paste made from rose water, lavender, and cuttlefish. And the year 1530 saw the publication of the first textbook on dentistry in Germany. And at the end of the Tudor period, Shakespeare makes casual reference to cleaning teeth in a play. But barber surgeons continued to ply their trade. If not a barber surgeon, then maybe a juggler followed by a tooth drawer to thrill the crowd. The 17th century saw French physician Pierre Fauchard lay the foundations of modern dentistry. He dismissed concepts such as the toothworm and published a book, The Surgeon Dentist. One concession to former ways was the use of urine as a mouthwash. But among his many developments were the cleaning, separation, removal of caries, cauterizing, filling, straightening, and strengthening of teeth, and the statement that sugar caused decay. The first dental textbook written in English was Operator for the Teeth by Charles Allen in 1685. And in the 1700s, in Georgian England, dentistry was finding its feet as a profession. There were many developments, though some practices did continue, including, yes, the use of urine as a mouthwash. One new practice was the use of gunpowder to clean teeth, though I can only imagine that smoking at the same time would have been ill-advised. They also made use of red-hot wires to cauterize patients' nerve endings. Fillings were an exciting development, though your filling choice lay with either poisonous lead or that Neolithic solution, beeswax. 
The Georgians also developed porcelain fillings, though unfortunately the lovely white filling would tend to kill the tooth around it. If a tooth had to be polled, a replacement carved from ivory or walrus tusk was always a possibility. Now, many people seem to think that George Washington had false teeth made from wood. This isn't true. They were actually made from his own teeth, cow's teeth, and hippopotamus ivory. Unfortunately, they were set in a metal mouthpiece with springs, which fit poorly and distorted the shape of his mouth. In the late 1700s, English prisoner William Addis is thought to have developed the first mass-produced toothbrush. In his cell, he was unhappy with simply rubbing a rag on his teeth. He saved a small bone from a prison meal, obtained bristles from guards, drilled holes in the bone, glued them together, and voila, a toothbrush. After his release, Addis became very wealthy. Through the 1800s, the first dental colleges were opening, but with the industry of oral health came a requirement for raw materials, for prosthesis. Before porcelain teeth for dentures were perfected, they were usually teeth pulled from the mouths of dead soldiers, often soldiers who fought in the American Civil War. They were used domestically and shipped across the world by the barrel load. The 19th century also saw the development of toothpastes in jars. And in 1892, Dr. Washington Sheffield of Connecticut was the first to put toothpaste into a collapsible tube. No longer were urine-based pastes the only option. And so the world of oral health and dentistry as we know it today began to take shape at the beginning of the 20th century. This story sounds like progress. Though recent research shows that over the past 10,000 years, our narrowing diets and pursuit of oral health have actually reduced the spectrum of bacteria in our mouths, and surprisingly contributed to chronic diseases. Despite that, our summary of the archaeology of dentists has certainly lended me a fresh perspective. My dentist is well trained. They work in a clean, hygienic environment. Heck, I can brush my teeth with toothpaste. I don't have to rely on stale urine. And so, yes, I do feel a little better. But I don't think I'll ever enjoy going to the dentist. <laughs>